welcome to the Car Sim and Race Driver Show, presented by Hugh Hattrick. Here at Bathurst in the course, my very special guest, Peter Golly, Rascal Rabbit, Josh Martin. It's great to have you back on the show. Drive fast and try not to crash. Good evening and welcome to the Car Sim and Race Driver Show, where we've got the biggest setup we've ever had in the history of the show because we've got David Perel and Josh Martin. Good evening to you both. Hey, how's everyone? Thanks for having me on the show, Hugh. Ah, oh, you're very welcome. Now, I got the two of you on the show because I know you're both the big the big men at the sim grid that makes all these things happen. And you've had some very big announcements um, recently, and I thought, uh, who better but the two of you um, to go over these big new announcements of the championships that you've been doing with the sim grid and what you can offer all our keen sim racers. So who would like to start? I think Josh is going to have to start. All right, no pressure, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so the sim grid since we last spoke here is, you know, it's been growing really well. Um, we're now at just around 15, 16 pounds of members in total across our Discord and website. Um, you know, a big, big player now in the, the industry, which is awesome. Uh, we recently announced our World Cup series, uh, which a lot of people may have seen, you know, bringing together the best of the sim racing industry in terms of teams and drivers, uh, as well as, you know, broadcasting being supported by the, the virtual competition organization, VCO. Uh, and we've also got a $20,000 prize pool just to put the, the cherry on the cake. So, uh, yeah, it's been going really well. Um, obviously, you know, David's been working hard behind the scenes and we've been kind of helping him a long way with it. So it's uh, it's been going really well. Yeah. Now, didn't you say it was 16,000 uh, people involved in the SimGrid? Yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, that's kind of record growth. Because um, when you started early last year, um, I remember it was it was quite different, but you've, it's really kind of blossomed um, through this time. So what, what do you think has been the secret of the success of the SimGrid? I mean, well, we started in June or July last year um, with, uh, we took over a community called GZR from uh, Michael Hamlet, but Michael Hamlet, who, uh, who was running GZR, he just simply continued to run the SimGrid. He's the, the community sort of operational guy. And uh, Josh is the head of commercials and marketing and stuff. I think, honestly, we are, well, the thing that I tell the, the team, at least, is we have to focus on sim races, and we have to forget about the real racing drivers as much as possible, um, yeah. and just try our best to to create the best production uh, of sim racing possible. That, that goes from the sporting side all the way to broadcasting on YouTube. Uh, every Monday, when I'm, I meet with the guys, I'm always asking, does this does this look like the same quality as an F1 race? And if the answer is no, we have to keep pushing. So I think people are starting to appreciate that. I mean, for sure, stuff like the prize money helps, but we also have really, really cool tech. So for us, for the SimGrid, it's the easiest place to sign up to. Um, we have a daily racing platform where you can race every hour to practice. Wow. Um, stuff like that. So we're just, we're trying to always look at ways to make the life of a sim racer more pleasant, easier, I suppose. It seems to be working at the moment. Yeah. So what do you think it is that makes sim racing so appealing? Because it's, it's very different to any other type of game, isn't it? I mean, you know, you've got your kind of fighting games and all that kind of stuff and Grand Theft Autos. But sim racing, it, it tends to, to bring in a particular type of person or, you know, someone who maybe likes cars as well as racing. But what do you think it is that with things like a set of course, a competition and the games that you're running, what do you think that, that, that is that, that brings people um, to take part? I mean, at the end of the day, these games feel real. They're immersive. And you get to race at tracks that you would only dream of in real life. Um, and it just gives racing fans a place to to try and experience something that is very, very hard to to achieve in real life, to, be, to get to a racetrack and all that stuff. Um, it's, it's difficult. It's expensive. Some racing is a bit more affordable. But I still think we, we haven't even scratched the surface of the audience potential. Um, and you just have to compare it to other games like FIFA and Call of Duty and stuff to see that we still have a long way to go. Um, and for sure, there's a lot of people who enjoy some racing, but I think that we can still continue to find more and more people who haven't seen it yet and will hopefully 
come on board later, hopefully through the SimGrid, but yeah, through yeah. other platforms as well. Definitely. Yeah. I think, you know, what David said, you know, just to kind of follow on the back of that is um, from a psychological aspect as well, you know, sim racing presents a very unique opportunity in terms of the level of competition that's present, you know, whereas in Call of Duty or FIFA, you've got intense periods of maybe two, three minutes and then that's it. You know, in racing, whether it's real or virtual, you can be battling with someone for up to an hour, but you can also have, you know, pit strategies to deal with or the weather to deal with. And, you know, a lot of us are all adrenaline junkies that do this stuff. And I think anyone who is an adrenaline junkie would be drawn to sim racing. Um, and really, sim racing presents that unique opportunity to tell those stories of that amazing battle I had, you know. So it's, uh, there's a lot of reasons why people are drawn to it, I think. And I, I remember, uh, this must be over a year ago now, actually, probably even two years ago, I was watching you, David, doing a, a live stream. And uh, Josh, you were his engineer. Um, and it made me uh, beg the question of uh, when you're now doing the Coach Dave setups have you taken inspiration from each other's ideas about to set up the car or how did that all come about uh well we we josh and i don't, don't do the setups we yeah. because <laughs> we, we're not fast compared to like the ultimate aliens in acc um we wanted to fight for coach dave in order for people to be willing to pay money for a setup which before we did it was like a no-go um, we needed legitimate people doing uh doing the setup so we have a group of, of drivers and engineers, um, four drivers, four engineers. They work all day long um, working on, on car setups. And uh, th those those are the guys who, who essentially are creating the products that we sell. Um, and the engineers, they have real life experience and the drivers are pro sim racers. They're not real life drivers. I mean, I could swoop in there and give my recommendation, but that's coming from a place where I'm maybe half a second away from the ultimate pace. So my the setup that I would recommend to them is not the right setup for what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. I I suppose with that kind of setup, do you ever, do both of you kind of jump on every so often and see what the setups are like to give it a go um, and see what kind of direction that they're taking? Yeah, I mean, like David said, you know, the guys that are working at Coach Dave Academy, James Parker and the rest of the team, you know, they are guys who are living and breathing this game. They know all the nuances, but also how to make something that can be accessible to anybody, you know. So as much as David and I can jump in and like, you know, have a play about with it and stuff, these guys are on another level when it comes to the technical knowledge. And I think that's, you know, what really makes the, the Coach Dave Academy products so valuable is that, it's not someone who's doing it in their part time. And, you know, obviously there's nothing wrong with that, but it's people who are literally, you know, dedicating their passion uh, and their interest in order to create setups for anybody so that they can at least be competitive. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that, sorry, carry on. Carry no, on. no, Hugh, I was, because I've been away, I haven't been at my sim for three months. So when I arrived home today, um, the first thing I did was turn on my sim, try to new British GT tracks, and uh, I was using the Coach Dave setups. So, I made the smallest tweak to the dampers, one click, and for the rest of it, it seemed to to work okay. Um, and yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much the aim of, with with the setups is we don't want. Well, there's people like me who don't necessarily have the time in the evening to just to just work on a setup before a race the next day. Sometimes you only have time for the race, um, and you don't want to spend time on your setup. So. They, they're more convenience thing. Um, and that's why like the, the setups that we do are not at all about ultimate pace, like the fastest possible lap time. It's more about uh, some form of usability and trying to find a setup which is more usable than what you get in the game. And like forms is a good baseline where you can make your own modifications, but underlying is like good fundamentals from a real life engineer and a pro sim race, I suppose. Oh, it's, I mean, it's a fantastic offering to have because I've finally got a set of Corsa on this very machine that I'm using tonight, uh, which yeah. is a laptop. Um, and so I now I'm going to be connecting it to my um, uh, big screen at home um, so I can um, um, get it all sorted and actually start playing properly on the PC versions rather than PlayStation versions. And I, have, you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know where to start when it comes to getting a setup. Um, yeah. So I'm going to be using some of your setups and, and buying the um, what you what you've got for some of the cars. I, I mainly do GT4 at the moment, but I'll try and do some GT3 as well because um, it's a great it's great to be able to, um, to to have a setup that actually works. Because you think you no, know, normally when you do a standard setup on the game, it, it's quite slow or it's it's a good bit away of what you need. Um, so no, it's it's a fantastic service and offering. 
um, that you're putting on. Now, just to, to kind of slightly change the subject slightly, now that you, you two have been working with each other for quite some time, um, what have you learned from each other? Well, I've known Josh. <laughs> this will be good. <laughs> I've known Josh, I think, well, what was it, 2018, I think we met. Yeah. Um, Josh uh, was, I think we reached out via uh, online or something, but we met in person at the Nürburgring um, during a sprint race that I was doing. And already then I could tell, like, Josh was really an impressive kid because he was still quite, quite young then. Um, but like entrepreneurial and stuff like that. And I told him then, I'm like, mate, one day when I start a company, you're going to work for it. So, uh -huh. yeah, last year when I started Coach Dave, um, about four months or five months in, Josh came in at first as a contractor and now works full time. Um, the, co the cool thing is like, and it's, it's Josh, it's also Michael and James is, they're young guys under 30 years old, but they all know the sim racing world much more than I knew it. And I mean, like within the industry, like I knew sim racing from the point of view of a fan, someone who liked to drive some, some games or simulators. I mean, whereas Josh, Josh is on the ground. Oh, I think it's gone. Is his internet? Are you still there, Josh? Yep. Oh, yep. it's coming back. There we are. I'm back. Sorry. You're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's so, right. <laughs> I, where did you lose me? Just when you were saying um, that uh, Josh had come on full time last summer. Okay. So yeah, Josh came on full time, and the cool thing with Josh is he knows he knows the sim world like intimately. He knows everything that's going on in like a lot of companies, and is able to share vital information of like how to direct our competitions. Um, he has a really good pulse in the industry. So that's the cool thing with having someone like Josh uh, on board at the SimGrid. Um, you, you need people in this. If you want to make a successful sim racing company, you need people from the sim racing world. Um, and everyone at Coach Dave and the SimGrid comes from sim racing. We usually find everyone through our Discord community, to be honest. <laughs> that's brilliant. So Josh, the same question to you. What have you learned from David? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for, the, for those of you who don't know, obviously David's got a very successful background in, you know, technology and everything that he's achieved. And I'm sure that, you know, if he wants to, he can go into that tonight. But, um, you know, I've been in, I've been lucky enough to be in the sim racing landscape for the past sort of six or seven years in various forms. And um, David's kind of approached the industry with a very different outlook. You know, he's, like he said at the start of the interview, it's, you know, for racers by racers, um, but it's for sim racers by sim racers, you know? Um, and so for me, learning from him has been very much in terms of, you know, making sure that we deliver a quality product because, you know, I speak the language of sim racers and David does as well, but it's about finding that right blend. And, you know, with Michael and James and the whole SimGrid team, you know, we've been able to really put together a great product. And, you know, if you look at the Coach Dave Academy setups, for example, it's not just that you buy a setup. There's a dedicated support forum where you can chat to people like James who know the game inside out and you can get that support and really looked after. Um, and I think, yeah, I've learned a lot from David over the time, you know, even from a design aspect, um, marketing, just I've learned a lot from him. Um, and he, like you say, he's definitely going to be leaving an imprint in the industry that's going to shape it moving forward. So, Fantastic. Now, that's great. And one of the questions kind of following on from that, and I will come to the questions in the chat in a minute because we've got some very good questions that have been asked there. Um, there seems to be things that you can do in a game that you can't do in real life. Um, you see a lot of the time, I remember watching um, uh, uh, Kieran, you know, the Key 25 racing, and when he was braking, he seemed to change down gear straight away before he'd even kind of taken the speed off. But somehow on the game, it kind of adjusts for that. Um, are there other kind of little things that you think you can do in a game that you can't do in real life? Oh, for sure. Um, there's a lot of techniques that you have to use as a sim racer, which would never work in real life. Um, and like one of the things, the the way that you drive a sim, a car in a simulator fast is you kind of drive it almost like a cart on the rear, on the rear, uh, like a rear dominated setup, if you will. Mm -hmm. So you back it in a lot and then try and get the car straightened up. If you did that in real life, you'd spin out or crash or so on. Um, but what I've come to learn, especially during COVID times, is that, and I was guilty of this as well is we spend too much time trying to compare a sim racer to a real racer and a real racer to a sim racer but yeah. they're completely different disciplines you can't compare a rally driver to a circuit driver and you sh we shouldn't be comparing circuit 
or real life drivers to sim races because they they stand on their own um and that's why like i say to josh and them is as much as we can let's emphasize sim races and not real races because there's a lot of people in sim racing who don't actually yes yeah for sure they'd like to experience driving a real car but yeah. they want to be the best sim racer and that's yeah. different that what you need to be fast in a sim is not what you need to be fast in real life that's, that's without question mm -hmm. all right so we've got to concentrate on the sim racing and that's because yeah. i think that's a question i've had quite a lot is that people say you know how are the people doing the really fast times and then they say well the last half a second is almost like little glitches or little things that you do that you can do in the game that you can't do in real life yeah. so if you follow the There's video of, you you have to you have to exploit the game and that's that's true for any game you play it doesn't have to be a simulator I mean, you can drive a simulator as if it's real. That's, I believe, I, I used to be a really fast sim racer like 10 years ago, but as I've spent more time in real cars, um, I've gotten slower in sim racing because I have preconceived notions of how a car should be driven and it's yeah. not fast yeah. enough for the sim. So, mm. Now, that's, that's really good to know. Some fantastic detail there as to how to get quicker and how the two... Um, types of racing are different um, yet similar in different ways. But now I'll, I'll go to one of the questions that we have here from something called But But Dino. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but I hope hopefully I haven't insulted anybody. At, um, <laughs> and he says here, um, I'd love to know how ABS works, like IRL GT3 versus a set of Corsa competition, for instance. In a set of Corsa competition, it seems that rate output of 100% is faster as compared to say I racing, where you really want to hit 100%. Um, and he goes on to say, is the ABS system in real GT cars good enough that you can basically mash the pedal and let the computers figure it out? Or is it something where a finer touch is required? Um, so it's in real life, we don't have 100% braking. We have, it's measured on bar pressure. Um, right. And the first tenth of a second that you push that pedal, you have to push it through the floor as hard as you can. Because that's when you get your maximum sort of bite efficiency without the, the tire locking. Now, after that, that, after that little, like that punch on the brake, you can start to bleed it off so that you don't activate the ABS too much. But mm -hmm. this is the thing, like people think that um, traction control and ABS are driver aids, but they actually, they enhance the performance of the car. With the ABS, you can brake later, you can brake into the corner without locking the tires. And so on. Without ABS, you have to brake a little bit earlier and brake in a straight line. You have to release the brake before you turn in. So it's a very different technique. Both are difficult to be fast. Um, but eye racing, which is, I think, mentioned in this comment, um, in my opinion, has the least realistic experience uh, of all the simulators when it comes to braking. In eye racing, you have to be way too gentle. And if you're too aggressive, especially on the release of the pedal, you spin out. That doesn't happen in real life. Otherwise, you'd see a lot more people spinning out. Yeah. Um, so especially with ABS, we break as hard as we possibly can in the first tenth to two tenths of a second um, and then bleed off the, the brake from there. But if you've got a strong left leg, um, you, you probably can benefit in certain cars. Now, it depends. For example, in the Ferrari, if you go over 100 bar pressure, it you've lost, you're no longer, it's not necessary because up to 100 bar, bar pressure is your maximum braking efficiency. Still, to get to 100 bar pressure, you have to push the pedal pretty hard. But if you go over that, you're not just wasting your own energy um, yeah. because yeah. at that point, the ABS has already taken over. So if you're braking at 140 bar pressure, you might as well just brake at 95 and sort of relax a bit and save yourself for the rest of the race. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's good to know. And and how about you, Josh? Because you're a real. Uh, I remember watching you in your GT3 racing, and you were phenomenal at your starts. You can race with you know when when especially when I mean, it was we were racing at the Nurburgring GP circuit, and it was wet and dark, and mm -hmm. it looked dismal for racing conditions. Absolutely awful racing conditions. But you were racing your way through the field. How do you find that? You know, is there a key to getting a good start in GT3 racing, um, especially on on sims and making up places? 
Uh, it's a good question. I mean, from a technical aspect, you know, David's probably the better one to answer on that front. But I think in the, the sim, you know, the benefit that we have is we can practice starts 100 times over with very little cost, you know, whether that's mental resource or financial. So, um, you know, for that championship specifically, I was working quite closely with Will Daniels, um, who does a lot of real world engineer stuff. And he's been on the show, as you know. Um, and, you know, it was just about making sure that the, the setup was sent to get that compromise of being, you know, efficient, but not wasting resource. And, um yeah, it's hard to say if there, there's no magic key that will help. I, all I can say is just keep practicing and it doesn't even have to be on ACC, you know, practice in a mental reaction test. Just get get used to getting that button pressed as quickly as possible. Um, and then as long as your throttle application is consistent, you know, the TC will kick in and it will support the car as it goes through the acceleration phase. Um, that's all I can really suggest. I don't know if David's got anything to add on that. but Yeah, with, with, um, with simulators, you have the benefit of being able to practice every element of your, your race. Mm -hmm. And one of those things that you can do is you can crank up the AI in single player mode to maximum difficulty and then practice your starts from different positions on the grid and come up with set pieces, set pieces for where to position the car at the start, set pieces for overtaking and how to manipulate the cars around you to pull off an overtaking maneuver. Um, so I, I mean, I encourage that it, uh, with my guys from Coach Dave Academy. I say, look, it's all fair and well that you're optimizing the perfect lap. But how much time have you spent on optimizing your in-lap? How much time have you spent optimizing your start? Um, because we have the benefit of being able to practice those things in a sim. So, you know, come up with, tr try a start from third place. Try a start from last place. Try a start from the middle of the pack. Um, yeah. and see which racing lines work for each of those starting positions because oftentimes you can carry that over to the actual sim race itself if you have a certain line that you've chosen outside of turn one inside of turn two and so on yeah what's your kind of least favorite starting position instead of out of interest if you're in a big race like a real race um i always think you're going to see you're going to be last but do you think it's it's maybe sometimes uh, more dangerous starting mid-pack than actually starting last because everyone's in the in the thick of the action. Yeah, oftentimes in an endurance race, if you if you had a bad qualifying, you rather start last sometimes because you can get through the the accidents that will happen mid pack mm -hmm. if you if you're paying attention, and then from there you can really start to push um, and overtake cars cleanly. Whereas if you're in the mid pack, you just never know what's going to happen. You often Oftentimes you're unsighted. If you're racing in a Ferrari and there's a BMW M6 in front of you, you can't see anything except the rear of that BMW M6. So if yeah. someone in front of him crashes, oftentimes you only find out after the M6 has moved out the way and it's, and that's it's not too late, well. but it becomes dangerous. So yeah. I'm not saying that you intentionally want to qualify last, but sometimes, like Spa 24, I rather start last than, than starting 35th out of 70 cars because, whew, that start is scary. It's scary. And you'd rather just spend the time slowly getting your way through the field, which is possible. Yeah, yeah. Now, I have a quick question for you, because I was playing this the other night on a GT3 race on a set of Corsa, um, and it was great fun. It was at Mugello, or Mugello, however they pronounce it in Italy. Um, sure. And I found it very tricky coming around the first corner, um, because everyone seemed to be going off. It seems like the first corner draws you in, so you break quite a bit. And then this, uh, as you go through the second part of the corner, that's when you ended up spinning off. Um, is there an answer as to why that was happening? Um, because it seems to be, because it was in a, a Ferrari GT3 car, I think it was. Um, but everyone was spinning off, whether it be Porsches, Lamborghinis. Um, is it maybe, is it balance issue or are we just going too fast? I think you're going too fast. <laughs> if, if, if you're having issues at the exit of a corner, it means you've got on the power too early before you, the car's finished turning. So if the corner is going that way and you get on the power somewhere before you've gotten around the corner, you're going to drive this way. Yeah. And then you're going to add a lot of steering lock and eventually the car is just going to snap. Uh, um, right. And turn one at Mugello, you have to stay really, really tight because the priority is actually turn two and three. So compromise is key at that track. Compromising the exit of one turn to get better uh, approach to the next turn this is the the secret to Mugello. Ah, that's the thing it was quite a funny race it was the first one i'd ever done in gt3 on a set of corsa um, and i found out that people were spinning and they had left their cars facing the wrong way at the exit of turn one um yeah. they must have abandoned ship 
Um, and uh, so it was kind of everyone was crashing into them on on lap after lap. It was great fun though. I will have to say it was it was it was a good good fun, and I'm really enjoying it. But what do you find um, for the first of all? I'll ask, I'll ask Josh. Uh, what are your favourite tracks on a set of course uh, competition? Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of racing, Nurburgring is probably going to be up there at my favourite. But I think you know, coming back to your points about Mugello and and even other circuits like Barcelona, every circuit can teach you something. You know, Mugello is a great circuit for learning patience and compromise. Um, the same with Monza. You know, being able to to let go of a little bit at the start of the corners, then get that gain and that clean run out the corners is it, hugely important. Um, I mean, Donington's always a good bit of fun um as well I, I think any circuit that's kind of got mid-speed technical corners where you have to get that balance of the car right is is always really rewarding and often produces quite good racecraft so that's kind of my preferences yeah oh fantastic and and uh how and uh, so I'll, I'll go on to you uh, david what are your favorite tracks that you like to race at um kyle Army, suzuka uh imola is my favorite in real life and in um in uh in the game as well i love the flow of imola i love how aggressive you have to be on the curbs it requires a lot of precision and there's no track in the world like imola honestly it's just i think it's twice as good as my next favorite um but yeah that's it oh it's fantastic it's uh, uh, do you like the imola that was pre-1994 when you had the proper tamburello corner which was that incredibly fast left long left hand bend yeah. and the big a magnificent corner for many years. Would you I prefer think it, to I think it's better now? I think it's better now with the chicanes. All right. Yeah. yeah. You have to attack the chicanes so hard. Previously, it was probably an easy flat corner in a Formula One. In modern days, it would probably also be almost easy flat. Yeah. Um, whereas now, there's a lot more going on. You have to compromise the entry. Uh, the second part of the chicane is, is flat if you get it right. Um, so... I think it's more rewarding to a driver now. And if you speak, I mean, if you, when Formula One was there this last year, uh, the comments from the drivers were like, this track is incredible. Terrible to race at, no question, but yeah. incredible to drive. I think it's like Monza, isn't it, in that way that it's got the history. It's got incredible motor racing history right the way through the, the decades uh, where they've yeah. had amazing races and, 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 uh, and, and historical events happen. Um, there, so it kind of it carries you. But no, that's it's good to know. Well, I'll get to some of the questions now. We've got something called Alaric Ulti Onslin. A uh, question for for Josh. I, I do apologise if I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, uh, question for Josh. Since he's from an open wheel background in sim racing, and since he's doing more GT now, what's the thing you miss most from open wheel racing? Uh, I think. The, the thing I miss the most is probably the, the one thing I'm actually most grateful for, which is that the, the fundamentals of driving a GT car are very different to driving an open wheel. Um, and, you know, when I did a lot of, of driver practice, even with, with Ulti and Alaric, I should say, you know, um, when you come out of a corner, you need to be on that throttle and you need to be on it, you know, smoothing consistently. And it's all about just getting up to 100%. Um, in open wheel cars, you can obviously, you can flick the back end out a bit more. Uh, you know, I'm a driver who prefers oversteer, so I kind of prefer to lean on the rear of the car than the front. Um, whereas in GT, I don't think you have as much of a luxury with the, you know, the variation in that sense. Um, so I think for me, being able to kind of just understand vehicle dynamics is always beneficial. Um, and also looking after your tires is where, you, well, you can get away with it a bit more of a, an open wheeler. Um, when it goes off the cliff, I think it's more punishing. But being able to learn those phases and the, the tire degradation is always beneficial in a GT car. So, yeah. No, that's fantastic. And uh, I'll go on to a quick question also from uh, Alert. This time it's for, for Dave. On what I don't planet... know the answer. I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. But, uh... Ulti is one of my test drivers. He knows. <laughs> I'm a huge Star Wars fan. But I haven't watched Clone Wars since the start of, since I think it came out. But it is on my list, Ulti. Because, yeah. I mean, The Mandalorian is based a lot on Clone Wars. Same producer. So... I need to go back and into the history books there. Sorry, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Now, we've got a great question from Gary Gilmore. And he says, on Gran Turismo Sport, uh, the Lewis Hamilton time trial challenge, do you think he was holding back? I would say probably not. I mean, the funny thing is the tracks where he didn't hold back, it took people ages to beat those times. The best Gran Turismo drivers in the world struggled yeah. to beat his Willow Springs time. The trouble is, Gran Turismo went to him and said, 
we need you to set a lap time at these 20 tracks. And Lewis is like, dude, I don't have that much time. So they probably said to him, okay, you got to come to the studio or we'll send you some stuff. And, and this is homework for you. Now, if someone told me that as even no matter how much you pay me, I'm not going to put a hundred percent into it because there's no competition. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think Lewis, he probably just did his best. He, he just focused on doing some clean laps, which Josh and I can attest to. When someone says, can you record a clean lap? It's like, oh, God. It's gonna be <laughs> it goes out of the window. Yeah. Um, it's clear to me that when he puts in the effort, he's, he can smoke anyone. But I, I think that Hamilton's one of the fastest drivers in history. I think he's the best, one of the best of all time. Um, if you gave him enough time in Gran Turismo, where there was a competition element and he actually cared as much as a sim racer, I don't think you'd touch him, actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, he used to play a lot of games, didn't he, when he was growing up? A lot of racing games. And I yeah, think that's yeah. when you when you start at a, a young age, it just keeps going and keeps going. That yeah. um, I, I've only ever managed to beat his one or by a fraction at Monza. That's the only one I could I could do. I was about eight tenths off his one at Willow Springs. And uh, and I gave up after a while on the other ones. But well, no, the Willow uh, Springs one is. <laughs> I, I don't think I've beaten it actually. That, uh, <laughs> that, um, no, they are they are they are good, but it's great fun. Now going back to, to Grand Turismo Sport, because I remember the, the first time I interviewed you, uh, David, and you were very much um, you know into GT Sport and saying that that was a, the, the 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 game to race for young sim racers and people wanting to get into it. Um, are you still in the same mind that uh, ninety minutes or, th or three races on on Grand Turismo Sport is enough? And that's the game to play? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, to in order to, to really get good at a sim, you, you need some form of discipline. Um, in my case, it's practicing for 90 minutes, but having some kind of structure to that practice, not just doing mindless laps. Uh -huh. I think it's always good to warm up on a baseline racetrack and car combination so you know where you are that day. In terms of like your mental, like are you are you on your lap record pace or are you like half a second off? So it's always worth knowing that. But it depends. I mean, the cool thing about Gran Turismo, at least, is it's the cheapest one of all modern sims, if you will. I know people say Gran Turismo isn't a sim, but whatever. Um, it's still the cheapest one to get going in. To get going in ACC, I literally had to do a crowdfunding initiative yeah. with the patreon to be able to afford the pc um, yeah. and if it wasn't for you know thrustmaster and so on it would have taken me even longer because thrustmaster sponsored me and they were able to give me the um the wheel and pedals um, to get going so n not a cheap endeavor if you want to go real sim racing if you will so gran turismo to me is an, a nice onboarding um into the sim racing world and that's what i care about because i want some racing to be as accessible as possible to people. Yeah. And I know that um, we, earlier in the show, but before then, the kind of build up um, to the start of the show, you were kind of saying, how is it, or how would it be possible to make kind of sim racing equipment uh, slightly cheaper and more accessible? Um, d d what, what would make that happen? What do you think would be a good way of, of kind of allowing or making that happen? Um, well, first of all, we need rigs that are easy to access. Playseat do a good job, but Playseat, in my opinion, are the only ones so far who have created a, a rig under $500, which is relatively sturdy, relatively easy to, to unpack. Um, that's one step. We have the Logitech and Thrustmaster wheels, which are at an affordable rate, but maybe we could go even lower than that. Um, I don't know. I don't produce those, those kinds of things. But the biggest issue for people who want to get into some racing is that it's not cheap. Um, yeah. You're going to be in for a thousand dollars at least yeah. um, just to get a basic rig up and running. Um, so I think that the, the aim has to be, how do you, how could you get a whole setup up and running for, for under $500? Um, and that's going to be a huge challenge, but someone's going to pull that off. And, you know, at the moment, you don't just buy a sim rig and it just arrives and there you are, you're rolling. You have to buy the chassis. You have to find a seat. All different websites. You have to find the wheels and pedals. Um, that requires a lot of Googling, a lot of, like, 
knowledge-based search, a lot of recommendations. It would be really cool if there was like one of these companies had, here is the startup rig to try sim racing. If you enjoy it, you can upgrade, boom. But if you just want to get started, if you just want to pretend that you lose Hamilton for less than 500 bucks, this is the one to have. Yeah. It doesn't exist at the moment. It really doesn't. Yeah, because it cost me over 300 pounds to get mine. And that was just for the, the play seat challenge and, and the G29 pedals yeah. and steering wheel, which I have to say has been pretty pretty reliable overall and a good setup. Um, but uh, I'm desperate to try things like the V-Rig or the Track Racer. Um, obviously, they're a bit more expensive, but I think they would be. <laughs> <laughs> what would be your ideal setup? First of all, to Josh, if you could have a kind of no expense spared. <laughs> He's got it. It's right behind him. I was going to say, full disclosure here, yeah, with the play seat and Thrustmaster, back and of course it's going to be you know frostmaster products or a play seat rig um so yeah i mean i'm relatively biased in this but i think just quickly to touch upon the you know the fact that david was making is that you need a disposable income to do sim racing at the moment and it's it's a huge barrier to entry and you know we um at the sim grid we run a more female racer series which is an awesome initiative at getting women into motorsport um and esports and you know even there there were stories of people borrowing you know their friends their dads their brothers rig to get involved and they shouldn't have to do that regardless of whether they're male or female you know um so i think gran turismo has done a great thing in terms of being able to captivate the mass market um and it's for the rest of the industry to kind of react to that and, and provide that quality racing experience at a reduced price um so I know that's slightly off topic, but yeah, in terms of my ideal setup would be, you know, Frostmaster and the play seat. <laughs> ah, you're doing the sponsors very well indeed. That, uh, that's fantastic. That, uh, now I'll come to the questions here again um, from uh, Alec Elty Onslin. Um, do you guys think there is a reason why a small fraction of the whole sim racing community focuses on rallying compared to track racing? I mean, it's the same in real life. Rallying is a smaller sport i suppose compared to circuit racing rallying's fun but okay honestly is there a rally game out there at the moment that truly feels like rally like i feel like the exploits in rally games is much more than the exploits in circuit racing from my yeah. experience mm. but i mean trust me i love playing dirt dirt rally mm. um, great fun yeah uh, so, Colonel Josh, you've been doing—you were doing a rally quite recently. I know I saw you did a live stream. What, what is it that draws you to uh, games like dirt rallying? Yeah, I mean, you know, in my personal opinion, I think rally drivers are the, the most are probably the most talented drivers out there compared to circuit or other drivers. And that's not to speak bad of any circuit driver, but I think you know, watching you know, Colin McRae is a perfect example. You know, he was able to do stuff that. I could only dream of um and you know i had the, i was lucky enough to watch you know david and, and john armstrong they did a, a Frostmaster challenge together where they did you know acc and then dirt rally and even there it was still engaging to watch um i think you know the, the lure of dirt, dirt racing is that you have to be so precise every single time and you have to be confident and committed to every move that you make whether it's braking or accelerating um and i think that's maybe part of why it's so niche is because it's so punishing but for those maybe that's the reward so that's kind of why i see it that way yeah. And David, I was going to say, do you ever fancy doing a, a proper rally, like a real rally? Has it, has it ever tempted you to try something like that? Um, yes and no. Yes, because it, it looks amazing, but I don't think I have the skills to to drive like those guys drive, truly. Um, what rally drivers are able to do and like their lack of fear is just insane. <laughs> I mean, I, I've raced at the, the Nordschleife and I knew where the track was going. And I, I was scared. And this, these guys drive flat out on, in on roads that they don't know. Um, and when they, if they make a mistake on the exit, they hit a tree. I hit a barrier, and I was scared of the barrier. They hit trees. Um, so you have to be born from a different planet to be able to be quick in rally. So I have driven a rally car. I drove an R5 um, spec. It was really fun. I did like maybe ten or twenty minutes or two 20 minute sessions it wasn't enough um but luckily for me it didn't i didn't get the rally bug which is apparently <laughs> very contagious <laughs> now that sounds fantastic 
But I was going to say, because um, you're both of you have got lots of experience with your gaming and, and real racing, and um, what do you think is coming in terms of new games? Because obviously, I know we've got Gran Turismo 7 eventually coming, maybe some point next year. Um, but in, because you're, you're very much into Assetto Corsa, and the, the original Assetto Corsa game has been out for a long time now. But do you think they will upgrade it and we'll start to see a kind of revamped version? Or the, and what kind of things do you think they might put in it? Thank you, Davis. Oh, okay. Well, uh, there was um, during the um, uh, the recent five of five games earnings call. Uh, five of five games own Kunos. Um, they mentioned that Kunos is working on a new version of Assetto Corsa. So I'm pretty sure that all the physics and stuff that they've learned from Assetto Corsa Competizione will be integrated into a new game at some point. Yeah. Um, I just hope that Competizione will st still has a lifespan beyond this year. So I hope that they add the new tracks that are coming in real life, Manico and, and Valencia. Yeah. Um, maybe they'll add the GT2 cars. I don't know. Um, but outside of that, I mean, we've got, I think that we, we're lacking a bit in the simulator department in terms of modern simulators. Project Cars 3 turned out to be an arcade game for yeah. iPhone. Um, Race room, it's it's cool, but it's still built in old technology. Um, the graphics and so on could definitely do as a revamp. Um, the physics are a bit older school. Um, iRacing does its thing. I'm not a massive fan. I've never have been of iRacing, but it's it's still by far the most popular sim racing platform. Mm -hmm. But it's iRacing versus ACC at the moment. Um, yeah. Those are the only two modern racing platforms. We need a we need a third one, yeah. in my opinion. Um, AMS2 tried to do something, but I think they made a mistake trying to base it off uh, the Project Cars um, physics engine, uh, Project Cars 2, because the Project Cars 2 physics engine wasn't necessarily the most realistic. Um, what would be cool, though, is if someone took AC, which has a huge modding community, and built, I don't know, a, a new game out of that um, using the, the developer's license. That would be cool to see, because that... The AC one still has pretty good physics, um, yeah, yeah. but it would nice. To, it would be nice to see someone like focus in on a particular kind of car, which isn't GT, like an LMP car or a Formula car, and create a, a new game out of that using the AC original AC technology with some modifications or upgrades, if you will, to the physics. That would be cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have to say, there's there's no doubt from playing. I mean, I was brought up on Gran Turismo. That was the game I played right away from PlayStation One, right away on as soon as it was available. I always always got my copy. Um, but then getting into a set of Corsa is just a different. Uh, it, it, for me, it's breathed life back into sim racing because I was so much on on GT Sport um, that I got quite bored of Gran Turismo. And then I think when they you know all the kind of things with the penalties and all the stuff that was going on, it seemed like it was just a free for all. Um, yeah. And that's actually starting on another question from that. With the sim grid, how do you avoid the kind of problems that they're having with Gran Turismo and people just crashing into each other, you know, and being quite reckless and, you know, stewarding a good race to make sure that it's fair and obviously maintains its appeal to drivers? You're never going to fix it because it's humans. Humans yeah. are playing these games and it doesn't, it's not just Gran Turismo. It's in every single ACC r race in the world, you're going to get someone who's going to say, this community can't drive. It's yeah. like, well, I've seen the best, the biggest races in ACC in the world take part, and the midfield is chaos. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the same thing happens in daily racing. The midfield is chaos. So in order to fix that problem, you're going to have to change human behavior, human nature. And... Um, there's always going to be a mixture of people and characters who want to try and win it in the first corner and those who want to try and take it a bit easier, those who want to learn, those who want to develop their skill set. You're mixing all of these people into a race where they yeah. start the race one meter apart. Yeah. It's going to be an accident. I mean, <laughs> today we had a – I don't even know why Michael decided to do this. But anyway, <laughs> we had this, um, this big grid race with 70 cars at Spa mixed wow. – Mixed GD3s, GD4s, cup cars, the whole deal. And our photographer just sends a photo about 15 minutes ago of the start. And it's complete chaos. <laughs> that sounds like something else, but 70 cars at Spa. I mean, that we think Gran Turismo is bad, but that is the formula for incredible chaos, wouldn't it? But uh, 
But no, that, that's that's quite the thing. But it's I suppose um, on the set of course of competition as well. If you hit somebody, you get a real result in terms of you get you know you feel the damage and it ruins your race or you know especially if it's on purpose. You would never you would I mean whenever most people when they play a set of course, uh, they're not going to try and take you out on purpose because they realise it will destroy the race. And yeah, I think that's yeah. a different approach. Because while in Gran Turismo, you can hit somebody and not really have any major issue. In fact, sometimes you can really benefit um, from doing it. Um, and I suppose it's the, the physics of the Assetto Corsa game then has obviously been slightly better designed. Because um, so, always the cars seem a lot heavier. And if you hit somebody, you end up spinning off rather than the other person. And the most part, when, whenever it's happened to me, if I've gone too quick, quick on the first lap and hit the curbs um, and gone off. But um, So do you think there's maybe a slightly better strategy with a set of course that compared to GT Sport. Josh Crawford. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I think, you know, this all stems back to the basic that David was saying, you know, in terms of human behavior is not going to change. So what you can do, though, is you can give the users the tools to make it a better experience. And that's, you know, the sim grid, what we've been working really hard on behind the scenes. And, you know, whether it's our your main series races, which are live stewarded by people who have real stewarding experience and sim experience, but also, you know, giving them a stewarding and appeal process so that they can understand and learn from their mistakes, you know, and make that kind of behavior not acceptable you know like you say you you know the contact physics model of accs is pretty good i would say you know i've got quite a bit of experience into hitting people and being hit so uh <laughs> I, I can say it's good but um i think in order to kind of get rid of that behavior you just have to make it as not enticing as possible and acc because of licensing issues doesn't have you know parts flying off the cars and stuff but even that at a fundamental level helps because people don't see the attraction of wiping out a field because they'll get to see tires and bodywork go everywhere so i think the landscape's changing um and the technology that you know we're putting in the sim grid is going to help help shift that fantastic no that's great now a quick question from loopy racing uh, for david do you still play gt sport uh, I haven't played anything for three months. I've been away from the sim. Um, before I left, I was still coaching on GD Sports. I just, uh, I'll be honest, I got a bit bored of the daily races. Um, yeah. I still love Gran Turismo. I have a PlayStation 5 just because of Gran Turismo 7, and then obviously, inevitably, they delayed it. So <laughs> I'm really, 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 really looking forward to Gran Turismo 7. Um, I hope it's not more of the same. I hope they make some small tweaks to the physics. I hope we have some of the old, like the classic tracks, Apricot Hill, Trial Mountain. Yeah. Because um, yeah. Gran Turismo would unquestionably make the um, the best fantasy tracks out of any game developer in the history of yeah. racing games. Um, and I love, I still love Gran Turismo, um, but I'm a bit bored of GT Sport. That's all. I think yeah, no, I think that has affected quite a few people in the same way, isn't it? I think it's it's the the the, the three or four years that it's been out, um, it, it's done incredibly well. But this last six months, it seemed to be a bit of a drag. I think just with everyone's got used to the daily races, and we're we're hoping for something new to help spice it up a bit um, and help it to compete on a, on a new level. Yeah, and, um, and I suppose the, the um, fat Furby, one of our uh, Australian friends, has said the problem is we all have a different idea of what racing is. And some people think that bombing and rubbing is racing um, or, you know, a set of course, a competition for the win. Um, so I suppose, yeah, people have different attitudes. Um, as you see, they'll dive bomb in some races, but not maybe in others. Now, let's get on to the real um, racing as well. Um, David, you were racing in, at the, in the Asian Le Mans series and did some, had, to, had a, some fantastic results there. Um, what was it? T tell the, the viewers uh, what's been happening in the early part of the year? Uh, yeah, so this year, to kick off the year, um, was the Asian Le Mans series, which didn't take part in Asia because of COVID. took part in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Um, really cool format, though. We had two races per weekend um, for two weeks. So four races in total. Two were in Dubai, two were in Abu Dhabi. Um, and as a result of this, like, compressed format, um, more affordable travel expenses for, for teams, because Asian Le Mans usually requires a lot of travel from Thailand, Japan, China, and, and Malaysia. Um, this was all done in um, close proximity to each other. Um, we had a massive grid of GT cars, 19 uh, GT Pro-Ams, and I think three or four GT Ams, which brought the grid to 22 or 23 cars. Um, and really competitive. Um, Really, really cool to see so many GT cars in the same class on a grid. 
Um, and I raced with Rinaldi Racing in the Ferrari. We had a really solid lineup. Rino Mastronati was our bronze driver. I was the silver driver. And we had a factory Ferrari driver, Davide Rigon, as our pro. Um, and it's cool because Rigon, he's a Formula One. He's, he's the Ferrari F1 sim test driver. He drives in the real Formula One simulator, I think, three, three or four days a week. So wow. it's, and he interacts with the F1 drivers. In fact, when Alonso had his accident during the time that we were there, Rigon called him. I'm sitting right there, and he's like, oh, let me just quickly call Alonso. And it's like he's got him on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really cool. I mean, I've been friends with Rigon for a while, but we got to spend two weeks together, and I got to grill him with a lot of questions about racing and stuff. Um, and we got on really well. We had a really good um, engineer, our engineer, Roberto. He is responsible for developing and creating the 48 GT3. So who better to engineer the car than the guy who made it? Wow. Um, and, yeah, we, I, we could have won the championship, in my opinion. But um, the Asian Le Mans format is it's heavily reliant on strategy. So in the first race, we missed out on strategy. So we finished eighth. The second race, we started last. 19th um, for technical reasons and we ended up second so that wow. was for me in my best race because in my stint i went from 19th to third place so that was really cool yeah. um, especially because when i arrived in dubai i was struggling to learn the track like to the level that was expected of me so that was that was um it was cool to finally get a decent result there um and then in the third race in abu dhabi we were fighting for the win and there was two cars ahead who uh, hadn't yet done their pit stops. And there was like 30 minutes to go or something. And um, we knew that they still had to do their pit stops. And after the pit stops, we would have come out either first or second. Yeah. Um, but just, I think, one lap before they had to do their pit stops, a full course yellow came out, and they oh. got a free pit stop. Because mm. when everyone's doing 80 kph, they could box, do their pit stop, didn't lose any time, relatively speaking, and could leave the pits again still in the lead. And that cost us, it cost us a win in race three, but it also ended up costing us the championship. So that was a bummer from that perspective. But our target in Asian Le Mans was to finish in the top three. So yeah. the following day, we started, I think, fifth. Um, I did the starts of each race. And uh, I, I came out second. And then on the third lap, someone hit me, like really bad, yeah. bent the exhausts up. And by some miracle, the car kept going. Like real, like ACC or Gran Turismo Sports impact. <laughs> and the car kept going. So Gran Turismo is a real simulator. <laughs> um, and we, we were fighting for the win on that one as well. But didn't quite have the pace. And also the strategy, the way that the full course yellows came around. We ended up finishing third. That, that particular race, Davide Rigon did a phenomenal job. We finished third because of him. Um, and as a result of that, we finished third in the championship and the team earned an entry to the real Lamar. So that was pretty cool because um, that's what we went there to achieve. And uh, it was unique because usually in GT racing, you only go racing if someone's paying for it. Someone like one of the drivers or combination of the drivers are paying for it. Um, and in this case, Rinaldi himself, he decided to risk his own money to try and earn this Lamar entry, which is very, very rare. Team owners don't do that because they don't make that much money from racing. Even though the budgets are huge, the margins are so tight. And he, was, he took the risk to try and earn that Lamar seat or entry to hopefully sell it to a customer afterwards, which he managed to do. So that was really cool to, to be able to be part of that was, was awesome. Um, and it was weird that it's March. Usually in March, I haven't driven a car now for five months usually, and I've already done an entire championship. So it's a bit of a strange start to the year, but a good one. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have, do you have plans for the rest, for the rest of, the year? of the year? Uh, yeah. Um, so I will be doing Lamar for the first time ever. I can't tell you with who it's not with Rinaldi. It's not with Kessel. Um, but I will be doing Lamar. 
um, which is really, 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 that's the only reason I came into racing um, when I was older, when I was 30. It was because of Le Mans. Um, and finally, after like six years of literally ridiculous levels of sacrifice and effort for me, um, it's it's happening. I mean, look, who knows what can change between now and August, but at the moment, I am scheduled to do Le Mans. So you never know. I sincerely hope you get there. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, but no, it'd be fantastic to see you race at Le Mans. Um, but on a on a slightly lighter note, I know that also you've been with us for nearly an hour, so I will I will round things up because I know you guys are very busy and have been very patient uh, and very generous with your time. Um, that um, are you going to do a big go kart race? Now that there's quite a few of you at the Sim Grid, um, are you going to have a bit of rivalry and start racing each other? Definitely, definitely. When when COVID op- uh, ends and lockdown ends, rather, um, well. I won't organize it. Josh will have to organize it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be, to be there. <laughs> to be fair, we, um, you know, we've, you know, speaking volumes to what you were saying earlier here about, you know, what I've learned from, from David and stuff. Part of that has been, you know, this company culture and, and remote working. And we've even been able to fit in a couple of staff nights of racing in ACC, haven't we? You know, and, uh, you know, maybe yeah. some toys were thrown out the pram at some points, but everyone enjoyed themselves. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the unique advantages of working in this industry is that you can do what you love with, you know, people that you enjoy being around. So it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's Nobody cool. Nobody got fired for dodgy moves or any penalties. No yeah, one was. Tense moment. <laughs> yes. It got that's awkward. That, that <laughs> tactic of don't take out the boss is uh, exactly. definitely... Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, can, you can wrap me as much as you want. It's for fun. It's for fun. <laughs> and uh, we've got a quick... Uh, a quick uh, uh, comment here from Alaric of the Onslin. Um, what, uh, for Josh, what's the road to sneaking into Le Mans and acting like you're French? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, mate. I don't know. If he works it out, let me know. Let me know. <laughs> and definitely not a bird says, I'm ready to beat all of you. So it must be one of your staff. That um, so uh, is that Jack? I reckon. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, no, it's it's fantastic. Look, I really appreciate the both of you coming on the show tonight um, and talking about uh, all the fantastic opportunities there at the Sim Grid and what you've been doing um, for all us Sim racers and fans. And it's really good. And send us the details for links for the Sim Grid, and we will put it on in the description for the future for us uh, as more viewers come along. To watch the show um but are there any kind of last minute tips that the two of you would like to give um to do well in the sim grid um for all those uh, eager sim racers that are watching what's the keys to winning with the sim grid championships practice just to practice and you know, the daily racing stuff is probably the best place because you can race you can practice your racing there um and it's not a championship event that's going to cost you in the long term so if you have the time, you're welcome to join the SimGrid. It's for free and uh, drive as much as you want. And we'll appreciate your company. Fantastic. And for Josh, you have anything to, to add to that? No, I think you say much hit the nail on the head there. You know, if you don't get the time to race, you can always check out the, the Coach Dave Academy blog. You know, there's loads of great resource on there about even the basics of ACC where you can, you know, get yourself some knowledge and, and maybe find something you enjoy. So check us out. Fantastic. Well, for all you guys who've been watching from all over the world, I know we've got people from Australia and New Zealand and America and all over the world. It's great to have you all with us. And in fact, I realized that David said our catchphrase earlier on in the interview, you probably didn't didn't realize, but you said, win it at the first corner. And of course, that's our our crazy, (laughs) our crazy scheme. Just how amateur we all are, or as I am, I won't speak for anybody else. Um, for me, um, that was the one that happened. Says when, when they, actually, when, when my good uh, colleague Jonathan was, uh, he was about to do his final racing test, and in order for him to complete his license and manage to be allowed to race, um, they had to do the debrief uh, the, before the, the race. Um, and the, 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 the chief steward of Silverstone said, "Right, does, any, does everyone know what they're doing? And uh, everyone happy or any questions?" And Jonathan said, "Yes." I'm going to win the race at the first corner. And he just put his hands over his head and went, oh, good grief. You know, you know what? So, but in all fairness, he didn't crash. And he did finish. Did he, 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 he finished third. Finished third oh, in his first race. So 
Yeah, which is not bad. And then the second one you got from 11th to 5th, I think it was, um, which was pretty good going on the on the kind of stow circuit at Silverstone. Um, so that's where I took that that comment from. But it's been an absolute pleasure um, to have you both on the show tonight. Um, and with all the things you've been doing, wish you all the best for the year. And hopefully we can meet you again in person um, in, in, in some of the events that are coming up um, as COVID releases. It will be great to, to see you. That, thank um, you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. Thank you very much. And to all our viewers, you've been watching the Car Sim and Race Driver Show with two of the stars of sim racing, David Perel and Josh Martin. Take care, stay on the line, and we'll see you all very soon. Drive fast and try not to crash. Bye just now.